It's the Monday edition of the North Shore Drive podcast here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter. We're going to talk with Ray Fittipato, one of our Steelers beat writers, about assistant GM Andy Weidel. He spoke to Pittsburgh media. He drew up the Steelers draft board or big board that led to their draft class. We'll get this insight on him, not just on the top picks, but some of the later picks the Steelers had and what makes this draft class so special heading into rookie camp later this week. We'll also talk with Jason Mackey about the Pittsburgh Pirates and their seven-game slump. How can they get out of it? Will they get out of it? All that and more right here in the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Carter. As always, you can find this podcast on your favorite podcasting app and especially on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it on YouTube. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of our daily Monday through Friday episodes as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making the North Shore Drive podcast uh, one of your top listens all the time. Thank you so much uh, to everyone who checks us out. We got Ray Fittipaldo on here. Pittsburgh Post Gazette. We're breaking it down. Ray, you got a chance to talk with Andy Weidel. Was that your first chance talking to Andy Weidel, by the way, last Friday, or had he spoken with media before? No, he was up at St. Vincent, I want to say That's middle right. of training camp last year, like middle of August. That was our first introduction to him, you know, uh, in a in a big media setting. But uh yeah, this was the second time he was on the record with us. And I, you know, I thought he gave us some great insight to uh how he works with Mike Tomlin. Also, great insight in how he envisions the Steelers roster, um, not only this season, but down the road. So, uh, yeah, we got some good stuff to get into here. Absolutely. So let's talk about this. One thing that Andy Weidel talked about is something that I think you and I have talked about a lot, is that the Steelers are trying to get back to being a physically dominant team. And this doesn't mean they're going to run the ball nine out of ten times. They're going to run on first, second down, and throw on third. It's going to go back to cower ball. But it does mean they want to be able to win the line of scrimmage. You know, we talked about it. In 2020, they had the worst rushing offense. 2021, they had the worst rushing defense. And the, the ne- over the next few years, with the investments they've made, both in free agency and the NFL draft, they want to be able to have one of the better units on both sides of the ball there because they want to be able to – control control you know, set the set, set the tone of games to control the line of scrimmage so that they can win other battles and i i think this speaks to an identity the steelers had for a long time and then they kind of couldn't have it because just the investments they made they tried to specialize their offense with ben roethlisberger they gave him you know top weapons here and there and it just didn't work out for a super bowl run even though they were very competitive but now you you're rebuilding We've talked about Kenny Pickett a lot. We've talked about their efforts to rebuild in different places. And it seems like a lot of effort has been placed on being physical and kind of getting back that Steelers identity that they've always had of being the more physically dominant team. Yeah, Chris, they told us this in their moves in free agency in the draft, right? So um, they added Isaac Sayamalu as a starting left guard. They changed out every reserve position on the offensive line, bringing in three new guys and letting the three old guys go. And how many new defensive linemen did they bring in, right? Fajoko and um, Armand Watts. And um, they've just been very active in the trenches this offseason. But I thought on Friday it was the first time that those words were spoken loudly and clearly by a member of the Steelers organization. Um, You know, Mike Tomlin was asked this question right after the draft. Um, He didn't really answer it as authoritatively as Andy did. Andy's vision of Steelers football is we're going to pound you into submission. Mm -hmm. We're going to make you quit. Um, As you point out, you know, it's, it's 2023 NFL there. You have to be able to throw the ball. Um, But when they want to, and that's going on the road or that's late in games, they want to be able to close games out with the running game. And of course they want to be able to shut down the run. So, um, you know, I think everybody, Wrote about that on Friday. I thought that was the main talking point. Uh, just how, um, just how upfront um, Andy was about his vision of what he wants this football team to be. 
Right. And I also think, like, for those who might be thinking, oh, well, this is just an experiment the Steelers are going through with this new guy. This is a lot of what he helped do with the Eagles. They're a physically dominant team on both sides of the line scrimmage, whether it's offense or defense. They Heck, they've continued to make those investments with their trading up to get Jalen Carter and basically getting all of Georgia's defense on, on, on their side of the ball, on their side of the ball. But you look at what the Steelers are doing, even a little before Andy Weidel with the George Pickens pick last year, they're amassing a lot of Georgia offensive players with, uh, with George Pickens. Then you had Broderick Jones and now you got Darnell Washington. Uh, they're, They're trying to do this, but this is something that I think that if you don't have the best quarterback in the NFL or a top five quarterback in the NFL, like Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen or one of, one of those guys, then you're going to be in a position where um, you're you're going to need an often an offensive line to dominate. You're going to need a run game to take over games. You're going to need a defense that can get after the quarterback and stuff the run. I truly think that that's a huge part of what the what the Steelers need to be is kind of fit the model that the Eagles and other teams like the Niners have kind of played towards. Yeah, and if you take it a point further, um, I don't think the Eagles exactly knew what they had in Jalen Hurts until this season. I mean, he was a second round pick. Um, they played him early, but I mean, he really had a breakout season. And you look at the, what the 49ers do. I don't want to say anyone can quarterback that football team, but they've proven they can win with, um, you know, multiple Purdy. Guys. Yeah. Brock <laughs> Purdy, uh, Mr. Mr. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Yeah. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo, who I think we all believe and know was a mid-level yeah. starting quarterback in the NFL. Um, they made it to a Super Bowl with him. Uh, they almost did it with Brock Purdy, and who knows what would have happened in that game if he had stayed healthy and wouldn't have had to come out so early. So, um, you know, I, the Steelers um, believe in Kenny Pickett. Uh, th- there was a quote from Andy on Friday, um, you know, just about the, the quarterback that they think he is, the person, the leader they think he is. They want to do everything they can to build around him. But like Jalen Hurts last season, right, he hasn't taken that next step to where we know he's going to be maybe that um, – you know, upper echelon quarterback that they hope he's going to be. So, yeah, very similar situations. The Eagles are a little bit ahead of the Steelers right now, I would say. But yeah. uh, based on what the Steelers did in the draft, I think they're, you know, they're inching closer. And we'll see how it works out with Kenny's development here in year two. I also thought it was interesting him talking about trusting the doctors on Darnell Washington, because as we know, on draft day or on, on draft weekend, Darnell Washington, you know, a lot of people talked about him maybe sneaking into the first round, but definitely being a second round pick. And then he was not only in the third round, but the Steelers were able to trade down in the third round to right. get him. And there were reports about concerns about a knee injury, but Andy Weidel talked about, we trust our doctors and that's what, and that's what they wanted to do. And uh, I, I thought that was an interesting tip piece and a great comparison uh, on on your part in the piece to Landon Dickerson, an Eagles offensive lineman who had knee, a knee concern, and they made a pick, and he turned out to be a pretty good, good lineman for them. Yeah. So a lot of times the, the calculus that NFL teams use on this type of stuff is, you know, I think we all know, Chris, you remember Landon Dickerson was basically a first-round graded player by almost yep. everyone. Yep. He fell to, I, I think it was relatively early, six or eight picks into the second round where the Eagles grabbed him. So – what they were probably told by their doctors was, we think he's a really good, uh, you know, we think uh, he's going to be good for four years or five years. We probably don't think he's going to make it to a second contract. Okay. Um, and I think it's probably a similar situation with Darnell Washington. I don't want to, you know, say that for sure, but when a guy has um, a late first round grade, early second round grade, mid second round grade, like Washington had, I don't think anyone had him out of his top 50. No. Uh, when he basically tumbles almost to the fourth round, there's a reason for that. So, you know, I think the hope is the Sears can get as much out of him as they can early in his career. Hey, and Chris, if he makes it to a second contract, great. If he's a seven or eight year player for you, great. But in the immediate future, for the next four seasons, they're hoping that he can be an impact player um, on their football team. And they weren't really concerned about the long-term future second contract type of stuff than what they are with most first and second round picks. 
Absolutely. We want to talk about some of these day three picks as well and what Andy White was talking about them and the value that they'll bring to the Steelers because we've been talking about a lot of the, a lot of the upper part of this draft class. We'll talk a little bit about that here on the North Shore Drive podcast in just a second here. But first, before we do that, I want to talk to you guys about our great sponsors at GameTime.co. Whether you're buying tickets for your favorite event, it shouldn't be stressful. GameTime is the app that you can download right to your phone that's going to give you the fast and easy way to buy tickets for your favorite sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. You get killer de- deals on last-minute tickets, and they have their best pre- best price guaranteed so you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you'll have the game time app allows you to book tickets at the last minute if you didn't plan far out in advance and that that makes it easier for those who yeah you change your mind like i did when i went to a pirates baseball game this past weekend and i used game time to get me a better price on the tickets and and just like they promised that i got an exclusive flash deal on on some baseball tickets was able to get into the stadium for cheaper than what i was finding in a lot of other places online and that goes also for football events basketball events concerts comedy theater and much, much more. And the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code PITT PIT, uh, all, all capital letters, all one word, and you'll get $20 off your first purchase of $150 or more. Or go to their website, gametime.co. Terms apply, create an account, and redeem code PITT PIT for $20 off a purchase of $150 or more. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We're back here in the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. I'm Chris Carter. He's Ray Fittipaldo. You can find all of our content at post gazette.com. Um, Ray, let's talk about the, this, the day three draft and something that you're working on for the post Gazette right now, uh, as far as a written piece. And that's talking about these day three picks here, especially led by Nick Herbig and Herbig's an interesting player because he's an outside linebacker. He's defined as, as being an edge player, but when you look at him being six foot two and, you know, not overly, ex- you know, overly strong, like decent, decent athletic numbers, but nothing crazy. Um, you look at him and you're thinking like, man, like a lot of people wonder, can he play off ball linebacker? And there's the, there's the thought that maybe he could, but I think it's interesting because you look at that and you look at some of the versatility that they're trying to add on defense. And it speaks a lot to what I think Steelers teams are, what defensive teams across the NFL are going to have to adjust to with the way offense is played right now. Yeah, Chris. I mean, if you look at it, um, they made a similar pick last year when they chose the Marvin Leal in the third Absolutely. round out of Texas A&M. Um, you know, I, I think he, he's a guy who could play three technique. He could play five technique. But as we saw last year when T.J. Watt was injured, he could even go outside and play three, four outside linebacker. Now with with Herbig, it's a little bit different because he played three, four outside linebacker um, at Wisconsin. Or at least that was his predominant position. But Andy Weidel mentioned on Friday that, you know, he could play stack linebacker. And he did a little bit of that in college as well. So at 6'2", 240 pounds, um, you know, Andy said they think he could add weight, and that's going to not happen naturally. But it didn't sound like it was going to be an all-out effort to bulk him up to that traditional 250, 255, three, out, three four outside linebacker frame. Um, so, you know, I, I think what they envision him as is maybe like a chess piece. You know, in some situations, you're going to rush the passer um, on third downs, maybe third and longs. In other situations, you're a pretty good athlete. You got a lot of intangible qualities. Maybe we'll ask you to play off the ball a little bit and do some things as well. So I don't think they've quite figured it out yet what his role exactly will be, but they like the person, they like his background, and they like obviously how much he played and how much he produced with the Badgers. I, I hear that. And the, the, again, that that the way that he played football for for them, you saw they, they, you liked the physicality, you liked the different techniques that he brought in. I also thought one thing that showed really good from Nick Herbig, and you know, there's we can see clips of him working with T.J. Watt on his technique. But he's a guy who found ways to win with different techniques at the collegiate level, and that was a learning curve that even T.J. Watt kind of had to learn when he came to the NFL. T.J. Watt didn't have a wide assortment of moves; he just beat you with being the stronger, more explosive person until he kind of learned a few more moves in the NFL. And it, like his first his first year took him some time to learn it. He had still had a good rookie season, but then by his second year, you saw he had, he had about two or three different moves that he could he could dip into, and then offensive line would be confused by it. And Herbig's going to bring that, but like you said, he can also play a little bit off ball linebacker. He studied a little bit. That kind of stuff's important. It's why Cam Sutton was so important. I think it's why Cam Sutton was signed for such a big contract by, by the 
Detroit line. There, there's there's this want to have guys that can fill different roles so that you can throw them on the field. And if an offense catches you off guard with something, they can they can adjust to it. Or you can catch the offensive guard with your own alignments. And I truly think Herbig is part of that plan, like DeMarvin Leal is, uh, that the Steelers have going forward to this future. Yeah, I mean, teams really value that versatility. I thought, you know, your example of Cam Sutton was spot on. Um, he's a guy who could play inside corner, outside corner, even played a little bit of uh, safety for the Steelers in dime over the years. So that's what teams are looking for um, as they try to defend these multiple, very versatile and specialized offenses um, that are populating the, the NFL right now. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it happens with every position. Um, you know, your your slot corners have to be able to be versatile enough to do more than just cover. Um, your inside linebackers have to do more than just defend the run, right? They got to be able to drop back and play pass coverage too. So mm -hmm. um, defense, I think, in the NFL is getting harder to play for a couple of reasons. Number one is the multiple offenses and how specialized it is. Yeah. And then, you know, number two is just, you know, the, the, the way the roles are written, it just favors – scoring right now. So it does. Um, I, I think the more versatility you have on defense, um, the more flexibility that you have and how you can line up personnel wise, I think the teams are, you know, including the Steelers are trying to give themselves every opportunity to match up and compete on a week in week out basis. Uh, yeah. I, I agree with you there. Let's talk about Corey Trice though. Cause he's a, he, he was an interesting pick in the seventh round. Some people had him slotted as early as the third round. I didn't have him that high on my list, but I did think it was interesting that they were able to get a corner like him. He's six, three, like Joey Porter jr. Has long arms, really strong, uh, plays physical. He does. I, I think that he's less of the cover corner that Joey Porter jr. Is coming out of college, but still for a seventh round pick to get a corner of that size, it seems like an interesting value to have a guy that you can put him on special teams, see how he does. And if, and if he doesn't work out, oh, well, you just spent a seventh round pick on a very, you know, a well-sized cornerback. Yeah. I mean, at the very least, what did he run? Four, four, something at the combine. Yeah. That guy's going to be a, a very good special teams player. Mm -hmm. You would think whether it's as a gunner or whatever on the outside, punt coverage, kick coverage, um, big body. I think at the very least uh, they envision him as a good special teams player. Um, but I went back and I looked today, I think the second or third question um, of Grady Brown when he came in to talk about Trice was, can he play safety or will he play safety? And Grady basically said, well, we'll find out when he gets here. So a lot of mm. times coaches or their front office will come in there and say, boom, he's a corner. We're going to try him there first. We appreciate his position versatility, but we're going to start him here. Grady basically said, uh, we'll find out when he gets here. So, you know, I, I think he's going to start out as a corner, but I, I think, you know, in the back of their heads, I think they realize they have this big athlete who can run. Um, let's just find the best spot for him and we'll figure it out once he gets here. If you put him a six foot three guy, a guy, <laughs> if you maybe you specialized him to be your tight end eraser, that's another versatile way to play. Because remember, we remember when the Steelers drafted Terrell Edmonds, it was mainly to help with the getting with with tight end coverage because they were getting abused by tight ends for years before he got there. And then when he got there, he didn't eliminate tight end, but people weren't abusing them like they like they were. It, teams like the teams like the Ravens, they would try to get you with Mark Andrews, just get that size and speed mismatch where you know a, a tight end that was too fast for a linebacker but too big for a for a normal cornerback, you know that'd be a tough matchup for a lot of guys. Terrell Evans did that. Now he's gone, uh, but. Uh, and he's with the Eagles, but you know, a Corey, a Corey Trice, you're not expecting him to do that this year. But if you can teach him over the next couple of years, like, hey, we're going to put you in these different spots here, and your main job be physical at the line of scrimmage, which he, which is, I think that's the best part of his tape when you study him, is that you see him being willing to jam guys, make plays at the line of scrimmage, and bump and run. And if he's a guy that can get into hand fights with tight ends and win, or at least stalemate them. It can be a huge erasing point when you're facing against some of the teams out there that, that love they love to throw their tight ends so much. Yeah, if there's one thing we've learned about Grady Brown in his short time as D-backs coach, he loves big and physical corners. And he told us about that at the senior bowl when he was down there coordinating the defense. Um, you know, for that week, he wanted big corners who could get AFC North running backs on the ground. And of course, coverage is, you know, is the most important thing, but he values, and I think the Steelers value. Um, you know, that that physical style of corner. So I don't think it's any mistake that Joey Porter Jr. is going to wear Ike Taylor's number. 
Um, you know, they, they know each other going back years when, when Joey Porter senior played with the Steelers. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, get back to that type of football. Um, you know, Mike Tomlin coached Ike Taylor for the second half of his career. And, uh, I, I just think that's an identity that, uh, they want to embrace more. And I think it fits what we talked about in the first segment, right? Big, tough, physical football team that looks imposing coming off the bus and that can, um, do different things to offenses that uh, make you maybe make you change your style of play. So um, I thought a very uh, strong and calculated draft for the Sears. We'll see how guys like Trice and Herbig work out there. Day three picks, you know, you could basically um, call that a coin flip, but I like those picks. I like that versatility and just knowing the way Andy feels about them and Omar and Mike feel about those guys. I think all those guys this, uh, this year, maybe with the exception of Spencer Anderson, I think all those guys will make the 53-man roster and or the practice squad. And, hey, even Spencer Anderson as a second, seventh-round pick. By the way, like seventh-round picks, when people complain about them, I'm like, do you realize like those are like the most throwaway of picks? Like you want to try to get a guy, but at the same time, most seventh-round picks don't make rosters in the NFL. But even a lot Spencer of them don't Anderson, even make practice squads. Exactly. Like, that's my point is that when people – I've seen people complain like, oh, man, they wasted that seventh-round pick. It's like, do you realize – what seventh round picks are? Heck, sixth round picks aren't aren't even aren't even that that big. But when you even look at a Spencer Anderson, the idea of what he gives you—a guy that played every spot on the offensive line—and also you look at his relative athletic score, where, where you know we're ranking all the guys and the stuff that and, and how they compared against other people who played their positions. He scored in the nines, nine in the nine out of ten range. So he's he was a really athletic offensive lineman who was very versatile. If he doesn't work out, boo hoo. You missed on a seventh round pick. Everyone does every year multiple times. It's, it's, it's all right. But I do think that he it, 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 it adds to the versatility that we've been talking about, just like Herbig and potentially Trice and potentially a lot of players in this defense. Hey, maybe he's a guy like J.C. Hassenauer who spends a couple mm -hmm. of years on the practice squad. Then he graduates to a role on the roster. We saw that happen with Matt Filer. Yeah. Matt Filer came yeah. in. Um, you know, He was on the practice squad for about a year or so. And not only do, does he become a valuable member of the 53-man roster, he eventually starts, and he starts a couple of seasons for them. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure Anderson is, is a developmental player. Um, we'll see how that goes. But, uh, yeah, when you when you take guys who have those rare athleticism scores, um, you're counting on your coaches to make him into a player. And it doesn't always work out, but sometimes I definitely think it's worth a gamble. Absolutely. We'll have more coverage as, uh, as the Steelers as they get ready for rookie camp to be to be breaking out soon here. The Pittsburgh Post Gazette will be all over it as always. Ray, thanks so much for joining us. We're going to switch topics. We're going to switch to the Buckos. It's not it's not as happy times as it was in April right now. They're on a seven game losing streak back to back times getting swept this time at home to the Blue Jays. What's going on there? Well, we'll go to our man Jason Mackey, who's been on the scene and what and how the Pirates can get out of this slump. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute here. Stick with us here on the North Shore Drive Podcast. We're back here on the North Shore Drive Podcast. Your host, Chris Carter, here. We switch topics to the Buckos. Jason Mackey, our esteemed Pirates reporter here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Get all his content at post-gazette.com. The Pirates are in a seven-game skid. Now, Jason can't be respons held responsible for the last two because he's been working the Dick Groat funeral and doing a lot of other <laughs> things there. Go read that piece. It's also really awesome if you want to get more of a sense of the respect and honor that, that Dick Groat carried in, as his name across the city. But I want to talk to you, Jason, about this seven-game skid and what the Pirates need to do to get out of it because – you know, we talked about this was probably coming at some point. Every team has a slump. It's just something that happens. Uh, but the Pirates, the kind of the grace that you've built through such a successful April, even with a seven-game skid, they're 20-15. and 15. They're five games over 500, and they're first in the NL Central. They've got the Rockies coming up uh, Monday through Wednesday in a three-game series. Then they go back on the road to play the Orioles. Uh, what do they need to do, focusing on themselves, what do they need to do to get out of this slump? Yeah, Chris, and I guess I'm responsible for the start of it. I was in Tampa, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not completely absolved. I, um, I was trying to protect you, man. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, here's the thing with that. If you would have told any Pirates fan in the world, like, you're going to get 20 and 15 after 35 games, will you take it? I'll take it. Of course you'd take it. Of course you'd take it. It's a mm -hmm. long season. Um, now, they, they certainly need to snap out of that, and I'm going to boomerang back to that point in about 10 seconds. But, you know, I, my, my overarching feel on this team – is that they're still better than they were last year as a pirate. I know it's tough to see that right now. 
Mm-hmm. Um, they, they played really bad baseball against the Blue Jays. They played really bad baseball against the Rays. They're trying too hard. They've got young guys who are pressing, whatever. To get back to where they want to go, Chris, I, you need to do a couple things. One, relax. The first thing, the first step, just breathe. Um, you're seeing that manifest itself in a lot of bad swing decisions, a lot of strikeouts, um, outs on the bases that characterize the first game of the Blue Jays series. Don't make the first or last out of an inning at third. You know, right. you know first to third, you see the ball. Carlos Santana, you hesitate around the back. Just go back. Mm-hmm. Just go mm-hmm. back. Um, preserve those outs. They need better starting pitching. They have a hole on Tuesday. I do believe it's going to be Luis Ortiz coming up to make that start. They need him to be really good. They need their starting pitching. Again, they don't need 11 quality starts in a row but they need like five or six in that span. Um, The bullpen, the early inning guys need to be better. Like Bednar, Holderman, they've been fine. I don't worry about the late innings, but getting the ball to those guys, they need to be better. You need to make routine plays. They botched too many. G1, Bay, Rodolfo Castro, those are young guys trying too hard. They're not bad baseball players. They're just kind of a little wrapped around the axle mentally. Need to relax a little bit. They're going to be fine. I hear you on that. How much of this also is – are teams making adjustments to the Pirates based off of their success or, or uh, that are kind of helping, you know, influence some of more of these mistakes that they're making? Or are the Pirates, this this is just about them and they're just kind of having some crash back down to earth moments where they got to get back to what made them successful? Yeah, a little bit of both. A little bit of both. And, and honestly, Chris, the way I see it, it's the Pirates beating themselves more than other teams beating the Pirates. You gotcha. could probably make an exception with the Rays. They've just been so darn good. Uh, and, and like, we'll never really know, right? Like the Pirates beat themselves and the Rays beat them. The Rays are just really, really good and playing. Mm-hmm. Really well. um, with the Blue Jays and a lot of the stuff, like I see the Pirates beating themselves. Like Rowanzi Contreras yesterday beat himself. You get yeah. ahead and counts and then you groove pitches. Of course they're going to get smashed. Like mm-hmm. ask, ask Mitch Keller about that one. Ask Rich Hill about that one. Um, you know, it's not like Rowanzi Contreras does not have the ability to get major league hitters out. We've seen it. But if you leave a curveball 0-2 over the, par- the heart of the plate, like any hitter in major league baseball is going to crush that. That's a misexecuted right. pitch. So I, I look at that and I, I see a team, again, that that is young, that needs to figure out how to get out of stuff like this, that needs to realize sometimes less is more. Um, don't you're, you're not going to win seven in a row in, in one inning. Just win that inning. And it's trying to figure that out. And that's a hard lesson. Anybody who's played baseball has has pressed, has tried too hard, has been their own worst enemy. And to me, that's what I see out of this team right now. I, I agree with you there. I also think it's it's important to note these were two really good ball clubs that they that they lost to the Rays. You know, still the top team in baseball at 28 and 7, but that AL East is loaded. The Blue Jays at 21 and 14 are third, still behind the Orioles, who the Pirates have coming up in yep. the next series. Uh, and and even the the boss, all five teams have winning records right now in, in that in that division. Um, and if you even look at just the stats outside of their standings, uh, that the Rays lead in all teams in overall average. They also lead teams in, in in pitching wins, while the Blue Jays have now tied the Pirates for the most quality starts this season with 18. Uh, it just, I think that that needs to be taken into account here. But like you said, it still comes down to the Pirates not making the mistakes on their end, not making base running errors, pitching in the pitching in the right spots, and that was part of what built up. They still have the most stolen bases in baseball right now, and then they're tied with the Blue Jays. But that's still 18 quality spots starts by their pitchers. They've done the work to do this. I think it's the thing that like, we know they can do it. They just got to get back to those basics. Yeah. And you know what, you know what else I think about Chris in that same vein, are you talking about how dominant the AL East has been? You know, what gives me hope for where the pirates are, Mm -hmm. how bad the central has been. Exactly. Central is the antithesis of the AL East, right? I agree. Yeah. The Cardinals stink. The Brewers are mediocre. I think the Cubs are okay. Um, Nobody's expecting the Reds to be world beaters this season. Like it is there for the pirates taking and you know, the pirates have done some good things statistically that you outlined the quality starts, stolen bases, uh, that uh, you hear me and others talk a lot about like the pirates throwing strikes, being around the zone, not being afraid to challenge hitters. Like that's part of quality starts. You're going to get there by throwing strikes, by challenging guys. They haven't done that enough. Um, you're going to score runs by getting on base. You're going to steal by getting on base. You can't do that if you're striking out. I know that that's a very basic concept and somebody's going to look at this and say, we know, Mac, you can score runs. You don't get on base. I, I get it. But like you got to start somewhere. Right. Like they, they were much better making swing decisions and getting on base, working walks. I mean, look at Jack Sawinski. Look mm-hmm. at Jack Sawinski early on when he's getting on base, when he's a threat, when he's not striking out 11 out of 
18 plate appearances or whatever the heck it was before he got back on track. It's a really good hitter. And he is a lot like a lot of guys in that clubhouse. And they need to just get on base, use their speed, use their athleticism. But it's not stuff that is impossible for them to do. The Pirates, you have a homestand here against the Rockies coming up Monday night, Tuesday night, and then Wednesday afternoon. Mitch Keller back on the mound for, for the for the Buckos against the Rockies. Jason, what do you see coming up in, in this series against the Rockies? Because this was a team that the Pirates swept handily just, just about a half a month ago, uh, you know, where they went to Colorado. They won 14-3, 5-3, and then 14-3 again against them there. Is this is this kind of the chance for them to kind of like, hey, let's make this the get right series so we can get back to who we were being? Yeah, I mean, they should. Um, I, I would also look at it from the Rockies perspective, Chris, and I worry a little bit about that one. Um, mm. Kyle Freeland, again, going tonight opposite Mitch Keller, as you said, the Pirates dominated him last time, embarrassed him, pulled out. I think he was in the third inning or something like that in his own ballpark. I mean, I remember looking at him and how frustrated he was and how poorly he performed that night. I doubt Kyle Freeland has forgotten about that. I doubt the mm. Rockies have forgotten about how how much the Pirates had their number. So I I am weary of that too, and that's why I, I sort of trace it to Mitch Keller. Like the guy's an ace, has pitched like an ace, started on opening day. Well, this is the job responsibility of an ace. You've got something really bad kind of building here, and you need to go out and take care of it. And you know, I wrote earlier like Rich Hill needs to be a stopper, and, and he wasn't. But I mean, in in baseball, like you need somebody to go out there and basically take everything else out of the equation. Don't let your fielders make plays in the plays they do make. They need to be so ridiculously easy because guys are mishitting hitting balls and you're just controlling counts. You're not putting guys on base. Like somebody needs to go out there and shove and it needs to be Mitch Keller tonight for the pirates to get back on track, get a little bit of confidence, make it easy on your offense, hold them down. Uh, I like the way Keller has been pitching Chris, but I, I think it's a very important role for him to play tonight and set the tone for the series. Absolutely. You can get all his coverage at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette to see how this series does go out Monday night baseball here in, in Pittsburgh as they take on the Rockies at PNC Park. Go check it out. Uh, and as always, check out Jason Mackey's his great work at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, post-gazette.com. You can also get our Steelers coverage. Thanks to Jason. Thanks to Ray for both of their work on the Steelers and the Pirates. We'll have more on the Wednesday edition of the North Shore Drive podcast that you can always find right here on all of our podcasting platforms and especially on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this channel to get all of our Monday, Wednesday, Friday episodes of the North Shore Drive podcast, but also our daily content that comes out from all the different sports we cover from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Again, this is Chris Carter signing off from the show. I'll be back Wednesday talking more sports here on the, on the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you're watching this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down below in the description.